Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Hong Kong Confidential. I'm Jules Hannaford and I'm your host. I'm an Australian woman and I've been living in Hong Kong for many years. I'm a mother, a teacher, an author, and I want to share my wisdom and the wisdom of others with you. Thanks for joining me and I hope you enjoy the show. I'd just like to take a moment to tell you about a book that I've written. It's a memoir called Fool Me Twice, and it's a story about my life with a focus on my journey internet dating, where I was scammed and injured in the process. It's an educational book that will help many other people not to get caught in the same trap that I was. I'd like to also take this opportunity to play my book promo for you. Here it is. From life on a farm in rural Australia, where wide open spaces made a young woman yearn to know what was beyond her country town. She moved to the city, became a mother, and found her dream career, which took her across the world. But still, something was missing. In her search for love, she traveled far, trusted deeply. She wanted so badly to find someone that she almost lost herself in the process and learned some hard lessons along the way. Fool Me Twice, a new memoir by Jules Hannaford. Available August 20th on Amazon. A warning to our listeners, some of the topics discussed in this podcast may be disturbing. If you need support, please contact your local crisis line or helpline. And if you're in Hong Kong and you'd like to call the Samaritans hotline, you can call them on 28960000. Today I'm here with Amal Leota Lu. Thank you for joining me today, Amal. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to have you here. Amal, what brings you to Hong Kong to the Asia Pacific Rainbow Families Forum? I've always had an interest in multicultural affairs, multi-ethnic, frame it how you want, that things to do with cultural and linguistic diverse communities. It's always been something, my work back in Melbourne involves that, to be able to give a voice and visibility to queer, trans people, intersex people of colour. Because where I'm from in Australia, it's kind of dominated by a particular culture. And so to be able to come, learn, share, and be open to having my ears opened wider, and my eyes open wider, and my heart as well, to what's going on in international GLBTIQ family. It's really lovely, isn't it? It's amazing. There's so many activists from all over the world. It's just wonderful, isn't it? The focus of the Rainbow Family Forum, it's been great. It's given a different dynamic when you go to other conferences or other GLBTI conferences. How's it different? I think it's the element of the cultural aspects that we come from different cultures and the fact that the space has been created and it's a safe space and a beautiful space to be able to have these discussions amongst people from other cultures. Because I actually think it kind of misses the boat in other events. Oh, that's really interesting. Amal, you're Samoan and Fafafini. Can you explain to me what a Fafafini is? Yeah. Okay, Fafafini is a layered term. So we don't have a word to describe gay or trans. It's a layered term. So people tend to associate it with trans women. But for some of us, it's a bit more universal. It's taking a different take on the GLBT acronym. Does it encompass everybody, really? That's the history that's known for that. But because of the change of just the way culture is, we find that we have some from our lesbian community 
who don't feel they necessarily fit that mould or the gay Samoan male who doesn't turn towards being trans, giving people their own individuality as well because the whawhawhine term has always been there for many, many decades and people have, you know, learned to grasp. I believe that cultures are forever changing and so a new language or a new dialogue has to be created for our other groups within our community. But whawhawhine literally means in the mannerisms of a woman. Oh, okay, right. But however, so we have those in our community, our geo, you know, taking on the Western concept. Fit under that umbrella. umbrella. Sure. And so that's come up in probably the last few years where we also have a term called whawhawhine. Oh, what's that? I've never heard of that's that. That's basically the opposite to what people look at as trans females. You've got... Trans male? Yeah, or lesbians. Oh, right. It's, that's so interesting. How are Fafafinis generally viewed within Samoan culture? In Samoan culture, they're, they're generally accepted. I think that the fact that we um family from the get-go when you're born, everybody's family. So we're not a culture that's good at cutting people off. We tend to be told to, it's okay to have differences, but learn to be forgiving. My struggle has been more in a Western culture because having to deal with two cultures, both Western and Samoan culture, and trying to find leverage on how I can make it work and how best I can hold space and feel good about myself just in general within a Western context, and it is a challenge. Is it harder for you to feel accepted or like you have a place in Western culture more so than Samoan culture? Yeah, it has because my journey, you know, the way I've evolved to be a Mal, mentally it's been quite challenging because you're feeling you need to tick certain box or look a certain way. And we're in Samoa, it's, you've got more important things been going on, more important things to focus than wanting to get on hormones. And so it's quite a interesting dynamic because there's one side that goes, you're fully accepted. However, you're not living in that world. You're not living in Samoa. You're living in Australia. And so just to deal with day-to-day things such as three of the things that feature high with trans people and gender diverse communities is housing, health and employment. And I think any person, you know, in Australia, if you don't have the three, it's a struggle. Of course it is. And harder to get those three being trans. Oh, yeah. I've had my fair share I've been unemployed, I've been homeless probably three times and no fault of my own. It was just a struggle financially to put food on my table and to be able to work knowing when you go for job interviews, that can be an issue. And I'm not the only one. There's been people that I know back home in Melbourne that go for the same situation. And mentally, I think for anybody, if you're in like a Western world, you don't have those three things. Mentally. Can be a massive struggle. Yep. 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 Tell me a bit about your childhood. What was that like? Oh, my childhood. I was a shy child. And I think it didn't help the fact that I can be open. I was sexually abused as a child. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. So you carry that stigma of guilt with you because you're trying to grasp the concept. But I also came from a culture where you're seen, but you're not heard. And that's a struggle. Is that as a child? or Yeah, as a child, but going into teenage years, going into adult And going through my teenage years, or probably 12, 13, identifying at the time as a male and feeling these different thoughts, you're trying to, it's the identity thing. And you're thinking, why do you act a certain way? Or why do you kind of look at people in a different way and think, wow, I'm kind of attracted to you. And so with all our lives, there's layers upon layers that come in for me. The layers that kind of affected me was the sexual abuse and just being able to live my life as a whawhawhine. I don't think I would have had the same struggles 
if I was living in Samoa because they have a better grasp on it. Oh, so were you a child in Australia? Uh, New Zealand and Australia. Oh, right, okay. You think if you were struggling with these issues in Samoa, it may have been easy, especially because you would have been able to see other fafafinis around yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And I just think to myself, I wouldn't have had to battle trying to prove myself because weighs heavily the physicality you're wanting to be this other gender and the world sees that in the norm you know what the so-called dot dot normal, <laughs> normal world yeah. either look like a female or a male if you're supposed to be wanting to represent the stereotype of the other sex and you don't quite fit the bill people kind of look at you people tend to physically go on the attack of the physical they do don't they yeah and so that doesn't help when you've got all these images on media and stuff and so for me it was just to try and navigate what works best for me and navigate a safe space for myself just grow and internally fall in love with myself oh and did you know you were transgender as a child or a teenager i think it was so funny because when my mum passed away and my aunties hadn't seen me for like 30 years and they said to me it was so funny they were singing and in the middle of this singing a salmon song they go to me we knew that you were your mum's favourite. And I was like, yeah, no kidding there. And then they kind of said, and in a nice way, I didn't feel that the intention was bad, but they always looked at it and we said, oh, we always knew. With my aunties, never felt any meanness from them. Because it's accepted in your culture. Yeah, so I think my challenges within anybody that was blood related, probably two of the people in my family, they were more or less challenging. But I think one of the people that I tended to fear, but he was just tough, he was just dad, was my dad. I think my relationship with my dad was a lot better than prior to five years due to his passing. But I think I had a lot of animosity because he was just a tough dad. But when I look at it, it was kind of tough love. But I had a different way of interpreting that. But I know him, that was dad's decision to be tough. Yeah. And deep down, you feel he still oh, yeah. loved you. Yeah. yeah. And my mum, she was amazing. Aww. And it was funny because they tended to compliment each other. My dad was like, an every now person, my mum was like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> my dad was quite serious and my mum was really funny. Oh, is that lovely? So it was a nice balance. Yeah, it actually was. And they actually passed away six weeks apart from each other. Wow. Yeah, it was kind of, it's that thing of we knew that they were a perfect match, you know, like to go that way. And I don't think, especially for my mum, she just loved that man. Oh, that's you know? beautiful. Isn't that lovely? Yeah, and so, yeah. Now, what age did you actually then transition? Physically transition probably in my, so I'm 47 now, probably early 10 years. Oh. For me, it was the involvement to myself, but I think the thing struggle for me was just to get the hormones and stuff like that because it wasn't cheap. Yeah, when you're struggling it's, to even get housing and food so and more, a job, it's yeah, hard. That's, yeah, that's more that's, important. Your rent is more important. And so those things are overlooked with a lot of trans and gender diverse it's people. It's such a shame that hormones given as a part of like a government program or support, yeah. isn't it? And I think that's a big challenge because people think, well, you're all on the same journey. But I just said, no, 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 no. Each person, you realize that trans people are at their different journeys. And I think there tends to be a culture clash with that in Australia because you've got the old schoolers that have a different view on the politics of being a trans person. Then you've got the new schoolers who go, well, no, we don't think like that. And that's what I was saying before, culture dynamics ever going to change and you have to find a way to navigate and adapt. Yeah, you do. So what work do you do to try and educate people about transgender rights and advocacy and what people need in the community if they're transgender? I do public speaking and performance, that stuff. My stuff is centred around the intersectionality of race, gender, culture, class. And so that encompasses what I do in my work. I work for a trans and gender diverse health clinic back in Australia, which is also a gay men's health clinic. But when I say that, it's also open to the trans community as well. Do you mentor other trans community members? My thing is I have a lot to do with queer, trans, intersex people of colour. 
And it's so funny because they actually inspire me to do what I do because it's trying to give space and voice and allow for our narratives to be discussed in the context that it is back home in Australia. It's being able to go, when you're going to say inclusion and diversity, we must include Indigenous people, our people with disability, ethnic communities, because back home, they still fail to recognise this. It's a much bigger picture, isn't it? It's yeah. really about all of these elements and it's about inclusion for everyone, yeah. isn't it? If I was in Samoa and I was to say, we're going to have a diverse and you know, be inclusive, and then in that whole panel, there's just Samoans. It does, you know, like I would just think, no, I feel comfortable. Like, but I said, we must allow for these other people to tell the story. Otherwise, what we actually do, we actually silencing people. And that's kind of how I feel. And it's trying to, for me, networking with great people and to see if there's anything we can do to get some visibility, to get the narratives going. Because back home in Australia, at the moment, there's an amazing group of young queer trans people of intersex colour that are doing some amazing stuff. Political, but I think to myself, they're allowed to be political, they're humans. They've got to fight. I said, yeah, because they're in another culture. They've got to make it happen for them. So to see them do their performance stuff, you know, generally the cultures are not usually invited to the table unless it's a multicultural week or stuff. But I just said, yeah, but I don't want to be ticking the boxes. I want people to be able to open their eyes and go, wow, we didn't know about that, but we want to give you the space to do your stuff. So there's more creation of an awareness I think one of the things that makes me do what I do is there was a trans Indonesian woman. She was a friend of mine and she was actually murdered a few years ago. Oh, no. Yeah, and it was kind of a sad situation because we didn't realise that she was in the relationship that she was in. And so to not have her voice heard, it only got heard when she actually died and she made the news. And I didn't realise how powerful media was, was when that story came out. But Australia media had a field day thinking that she was trans and she was a sex worker and stuff like that. It was kind of heartbreaking because what could we have done to support her? And that's my point of giving voice to people of colour to allow them to go, hey, we need to hear your stories. Encourage them to come forth. Because coming back to that thing, if you silence them, and you they won't come. They don't feel comfortable because you haven't actually given them the opportunity to talk. And it's like the, the coming back to the story of me growing up, be seen but not heard. It's kind of a relay effect. And I don't want that to happen to anybody. And so coming back to that death of my friend. She was probably, I mean, of course, she was much more than a transgender woman and a yeah, sex worker. Yeah, there would have right. been a whole multi layers to her story and her personality and the love she had to give and yeah. all aspects. And yet the media just focus on the sensational oh, you know, stuff. It was so funny because the way I found out was I was actually in Australia, but I found out through my friend in France. And media had a field day, like there was one headline that was front page in the Korea Mail and just, you know, this is you know, what trans people have copped, just the nastiness of that, you know? It's such a shame that that's still happening in this day and age. It shouldn't be that way. Right. And that's why the work that you're doing is so important because yeah. we've got to change hearts and minds and we've got to change the way that people treat marginalised groups of our society. society yeah. yeah. Do you suffer from discrimination at all at the moment? Not as much as I used to. I think one of the worst things I've been attacked... I've been spat on. I think that incident on the train really took me for a six and it made... I can't imagine what that would be like. Oh, terrible. How undignified. Yeah. It was Disgusting. Like, <laughs> yeah, so I don't get it as much. Mm. I think I'm a lot more resilient person, a lot more stronger. 
And I think I'm grateful for the great people I have around me, but also my family, you know, my blood family. It actually hasn't really been a major struggle with them. And that gives you that confidence, doesn't it? So perhaps you're not so vulnerable to people walking by you or in the community because they can see your sense of self. Yeah, it's kind of funny with family because, you know, feeling the need to prove to them. But in reality, you have nobody else I'm able to prove it to but yourself. You're going to grow old. You're going to die. And so you might as well be happy. It's the thing people wanting you to have a coming out. And I tell people, oh, I didn't have a coming out. I evolved the way that I evolved. But if I had a coming out, I came out of my mum's stomach. That was my coming out. That's that's really beautiful. And I love that, that you just evolved. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like it's also a culture thing. Like the other Pacific Island ladies that are here can cut, you know, there's similar journeys in their Pacific nations. You know, people are set on these idealistic views that, but I just think to myself, because we're warmly embraced within our own culture, it's like, okay, what next? Yeah. And that's actually I quite- just am. I'm just being. I'm not coming out. Yeah, yeah I love that. It actually just works for because you don't feel that there's an expectation for you to answer to any because I said you don't answer to anybody yet. Mal, can you tell me a little bit about your rainbow family? Okay, my rainbow family is myself, my partner whose background is Lebanese Muslim. And we have three children that stay with us. So we have his two nephews whose ages are 16 and 9. And then we have a little one who is four, as I said, going on 42. (laughs) What is she like? Is she just very wise? Yeah, she tends to connect quite well with older people. Like, and sometimes have to remind you, go be a child, go run around, which she loves, but she can always have those great conversations. I probably like that because I just say it and she kind of gets it, whereas the other two just have a little bit more to grasp. When I came into the family, every time I go into things, sometimes, especially with when I'm having to connect with people, it's in the back of my mind sometimes how people are going to take the thing about me being a trans person. I'm very fortunate that when I came into this family, the uncle is a trans male, the auntie is a trans female, the sister is a lesbian, one of the brothers dated a trans woman. And then I come in to the family and it's just like, yep, okay. So you were very welcome. Yes. I think the thing for me was not having to constantly explain my story because it does get tiring. Yeah. And that's been one of the battles that I faced on a constant day to day, just with life in general. And it gets quite tiring. But the fact that that situation is what it is, which is a beautiful situation to be in, but also the fact that my age is not an issue. This is with my partner. My age is not an issue. My race is not an issue. My gender identity is not an issue. And those three things to be able to have love in the form of having another person besides me to share in the ups and downs. I feel very blessed and very lucky to have that because sometimes we always say, oh, do things on our own, but it's just always to have that extra support. Yeah, it's lovely to have somebody else in your life to share your life with, isn't yeah. it? We originally met through Facebook, of all things. Did you? Yeah. Oh, my God, that's Seven cool. Years ago. Wow, that's really cool. And, you know, I always give a funny story. I said, oh, you know, when we first explained it to the kids, I would go, well, you know, your uncle... He was trying to hit on me. He threw this wonderful <laughs> fafa finesse on him, and he just went, bow, I need her. And I was like, get in line. <laughs> Brilliant. To, to get in line and take a number. Excellent. You had them all bashing at your door, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, apparently. <laughs> apparently. That's what you want him to think. <laughs> that's what I want him to think. Oh, that's great. And how do your children respond to being part of such a rainbow family? I think the fact that they've had situations where they've had different family members. So there's diversity in the whole family, family which is nice, yeah. isn't there? And so what we try to encourage the kids is to be honest and that it's important that to have integrity we just laid out as I'm trying best and there's been trial and error but as guardians of these kids we've learned to ourselves as well as the kids 
what stuff to say, what not to say, how best to approach it. And I think the kids being honest to them is a better, I don't expect them to fully understand because they're kids yeah, and they're growing. And I just allow them, you know, what I say to the kids is you're allowed to have a difference of opinion. Yeah. It's okay. You don't have to agree. But just be good to people and try to help each other out. And that's the kind of philosophy that I kind of carry on towards the kids, that if you can, help other people out. Do you know it would be nice if the whole world had that philosophy, just kindness and helping yeah. others, wouldn't it? It would be really lovely if we could all move in that direction. Yeah, my catchphrase is be kind and don't leave anybody behind. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. It's just like those offsprings to you. You want them to do well. You want them to, in their journey, and the young people that follow them, whether they're blood or not blood, you want their journey to be better for them yeah, and not go through some of the negative stuff that you had to go through. Yeah, and hopefully for the younger generations, things will improve because of the visibility of different groups and because of the celebrities that are out there being diverse. And I think people are becoming more open-minded. Do you think that's the case? Do you agree? I think there's still a lot of work to do. I'm sure. But I think if you take a proactive approach to it, like I was saying before, you don't have to agree. But I think there needs to be some kind of common goal to work towards. Otherwise, it's going back to the silencing of voices. And so that's where I've said to the kids, say how you feel. Me and dad, me, uncle may not agree with it. But that's okay. We don't have to. It's just like, whatever we say to you kids, you don't have to agree. I think to myself, it's the way you go about things. It's like your actions. Your actions speak louder than words. Just trying to encourage a healthy prospectus towards Mm things, outlook on things. Because I know that like nowadays, there's a lot of challenges the kids in their mind and way of thinking. And they want to be like certain individuals within their peer groups. And so it's just trying to get the kids to be level-headed about some of the decisions that they make. Yeah. But also allow for them to have space to grow. How old are your older two? The oldest one is 50, uh, 16. And this one, uh, his brother is about 10. They've got an older brother, right. but he stays in Sydney. But the older brother has left school. Oh, right. Wow. So, yeah, you've got a widespread of ages as well, well in the I, family. I've had a kind of crash course, one-on-one. In, in parenting? <laughs> yeah, not like I've always wanted to. And it just... And all of a sudden you've got three of them? Yeah, three of them. But I've always had this. It's with my nephews and nieces who I've grown up with who are probably 10 years my junior, you know, I tell them, I'm not your auntie, I'm your younger cousin. (laughs) (laughs) so cute. You know, but it's just because I growing up with my So there's always been this thing with young people and having worked with young people in the education system. I've always been passionate. It's been one of my passions is also I'm going from my experience as being a shy young person and not being able to have that courage to talk. You know, I think that kind of has set the precedence in my mind to help other people, but help young people as well, regardless yeah. of their cultural backgrounds and their social beliefs. I don't want, like, I don't want anybody to struggle. And for what I had to deal with myself, or you know, the abuse and just the coming of dealing with the sexuality of once upon a time and then realizing I wanted to change and having to deal with that. And so, you know, people say it's a double whammy, but I just said, yeah, but would I want it any other way? No, no, because I'm being real to myself. Yeah, and that's important, isn't it, to be real and be yourself. And you've got to go through that journey, I suppose, to find who you are. So the initial struggle with the sexuality and then working out that it was more about gender. Is that sort of how it evolved? Yeah, it's not so much a struggle with those things in terms of identifying that because I can identify and go, no, I love a certain individual. You know, Fafafini mm-hmm. is my identity and my cultural identity is Samoan. But it's just having to deal with the narrow-mindedness of people within the context of where I stay. And it's just what it is. And you have to kind of, you know, as I said, 
in the poem Rise. Yeah, yes. Yesterday you read the poem Still I Rise by Maya Angelou. Yeah. And that's really about still being yourself and rising above all of the crap. Yeah, isn't that's it? right. And that's what you're doing. Yeah, so it's just like a phoenix. Yeah, like a phoenix rising out of the ashes. Yes. And do you feel like you are happy with your life and who you are and that you're moving forward really positively I- now? I have a better sense of who I am. I think that's where I feel humbled by have the grace and the humility of beings and my cultural background and identifying as Fafafine. It grounds me, it humbles me, it allows me to be in a better place within myself. And I took account what I've learned from having those two identities. And then to add to it is that I've got the support of my own family, you know, my Samoan family, but also my partner and his family. Isn't that lovely? It must make it easier to deal with the outside judgment or negativity because you've got that support at home. And there's a lot of trans people that don't have that. And that must be so hard. When things get a bit too heavy, I'm able to go back to my part and just, I go into my own spaces where I'm able to do things that kind of, okay, I'm all needs time out. There was a situation where we had the marriage equality, marriage thing, and I decided to go to some more because basically it was just quite overwhelming. And why was that? You were in Melbourne during the marriage equality debate and vote in Australia. And why was that difficult and overwhelming? Is it because there was so much negativity coming out from the conservative edges? Initially, it was about marriage equality, that those that were on the attack took in everything into consideration. So in that GRBTIQ connection kind of frame, they felt they could want to bring out everything. And the trans and gender diverse stuff in the last few years has come to the forefront. It has. They called it the transgender tipping point in Time magazine, didn't they, in about 2016? And so that seemed to be an easy group to target. And so it came out in full force. When that happened, it was just like, it got a bit overwhelming for me. So I said, if he was having his wedding in Samoa, and so I decided to go, I was just like, I've got to go. <laughs> I'm out of here. I'm yeah. out of here. <laughs> yeah. And so I hadn't been in 34 years. And when I went, it was just coincidental. They had the Fafafine AGM, you know, the so following that, day. Yeah. So is that a whole of Samoa j- yeah. annual general meeting of oh, the Fafafine? And I was sitting, Did you go? Yeah, I was sitting there in complete awe because I just thought, Wow, look at the beautiful connection. It was like sitting with an extended family, because that's how we see culture as your extended families. That's how it felt. And it was a beautiful thing. And it was great to see both young and old be able to talk. But talk, there's the term that we call talanoa. So you're able to sit around in formal circle and just have a conversation with what's on. And that was beautiful. Then they had their Miss Fafafine pageant, which is an annual event. Oh, how fab. Oh, it was fabulous. Yeah. And the funny thing was they had it day after I left, so I couldn't extend my stay. But to be in that space at that time for that week, it just took my mind off the negativity or the clouded stuff that was hovering over me in Australia. And so for me to go also was like a self-care thing. Yeah, it's good for your well-being. Yeah. And so when I came back to Australia, it's the stuff still hadn't calmed down. So I took leave the week after I got back and I went to Sunshine Coast. I said to myself, I'm going to take my Janet Mock autograph book. Oh, I love Janet Mock. She's awesome. I've read her book and listened to her podcast. Yeah. Well, I saw her live in Melbourne (gasps) and I got her autograph and a photo with her. Oh, I'm jealous. Yeah. And so I was very lucky. I said to myself, you know, this was the self care thing coming to mind. And I said, I'm going to go to Sunshine Coast because I love Sunshine Coast. I'm going to go to Sunshine Coast. I'm going to go sit on a beach. And all I want to do is read Janet Mock. And it was the redefining realness. Oh, it's great. I love it. And surpassing certainty. So I sat on the beach and read both books. Right. And came away feeling, you know, you had to do that. And I think we tend to forget as human beings sometimes, and especially the community, GRBTI, trans, gender diversity, we tend to forget that self-care is important. And during that marriage equality time, 
That's what was needed. And it was kind of hard to find where can we go without it? Because that was the number one thing. Yeah, it was in your face, wasn't it, wherever you went? What do you see the future for you in trans activism or LGBTQ plus activism? What are you hoping for the future? I see a positive future for myself in terms of doing the work, doing the trans and getting involved. I've always been about networking. So it's important when I say this thing of being able to give voice and not have our voices silenced, sometimes we need to be proactive. And that means is stepping out of the comfort zone and going to meet people who you may not have met. You've just got to go invite yourself to things and try not to fear too much. I just said, it's just like a brand new thing. It's just like the conference that I've just recently attended, Rainbow Family Forum. Yeah, the United Nations one. The Hong Kong one. Oh, this one. Yeah, this yeah, one. yeah, this one. And the only way I came about it was just a post on Facebook. And it was just coincidental. Bess had seen me at another leadership training academy thing earlier this year. But she said she had wanted to talk, come up and talk to me. I said, Bess, you could have thrown your jandal at me. That's an island. <laughs> yeah, I know what a jandal is. Yeah, throw your jandal. Sandal. Yeah, sandal. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we connected. It was just my take of, I want to go meet these people. Great. And so I really had no idea at the moment attending it. It's been exciting and great. That thing of new territory for me to learn. But it's coming back to what I was saying before, um, the networking. I said... It's no good being a fly on the wall. Sometimes you have to apply yourself to just get over your fears. Yeah, step out of your comfort zone and have a go, yeah. I see, that was my theme for this year, was to step out of my comfort zone. You know how I was telling you. Yeah, you did say that. A Nelson Mandela song. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Mal auditioned for a, a musical and she just randomly picked a song right at the minute and you sang... Free Nelson Mandela, Mandela and you got selected in the I musical. Think if Nelson Mandela was still alive and he heard me, he'd probably want to still be locked up in jail. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, stepping outside your comfort zone, it makes you feel vulnerable and it can be a bit nerve wracking, but it's amazing the rewards that you can get, isn't it? It's the thing, you know, like how I was explaining with the kids that I have at home, it's kind of child in error. And so you never know until you give things a go. And I think I've taken a proactive approach in doing that, but also being able to shift What I mean by that for myself, there's going to be people you click with and people you don't. And I'm interested in the people that I do click with because those good people, like we're generally the people that you kind of want to have as your support. Yeah. I'm not into pleasing people. I think if you don't pay my bills and you don't pay my wages. Yeah, yeah, then you're right. I have nothing really to worry about. It's not a big issue. But I think, yeah, just having to apply myself. I've always done it without thinking like I've always done that. It's just having to push the boundaries of getting out there. And so just with some of the advocates that I've met in the past few days, they've had to do the same. They've had to step out of their comfort zone. They've had to just do it, whatever little resources that they had or within their own countries, the challenges that they face. It's incredible for the listeners out here at the Asia Pacific Rainbow Forum that we've been at this weekend. There have been activists from over 20 countries here and representatives from the United Nations and Amnesty International and the Australian Consulate. And it's been incredible to see and hear different stories. Like the storytelling aspect of it is really rewarding, isn't it? I'm always interested in that because I always think I can take from whatever I take from other people and see what's a good way of approaching things from a different perspective. You always know your own perspective because, hello, you lived with yourself for how many years. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. But sometimes you may not know all the answers or it's a case of what can you do better or who can I collaborate on a project that will be of great benefit. Like key markers, when I do my work and stuff, that's what I look out. Who do I know I can actually communicate quite well? And who are some people that I may be interested in, maybe in future projects down the line with a bit more discussion in collaborating on projects and stuff? Yeah, because there's certainly a whole bunch of people on the same page and all working for the greater good. And you can combine forces and really make a difference, can't you? And especially using things like social media and stuff like that. 
there's a lot of opportunity, isn't there, to make a difference? Yeah, and especially the fact that we all come from different, diverse backgrounds. That makes it even more special, oh, doesn't it? Oh, I totally love that. Yeah. The fact that we've had our own little group of United Nations. We have. And I think they're great contacts for future stuff to come. Yeah. But yeah, I just think to myself, it's been a privilege and an honour to have story share with people and have their stories be told and to know that you're not the only one going through some of the stuff that you may be. And so for me, that's quite humbling is to know that we can have those connections on a wider scale. I think what I've taken from this is the love and support is universal. Like, I see them more than just individuals that come from their different countries. It's been a beautiful thing. There's been a lot of laughing. Oh my God, that's just amazing. (laughs) Yeah. Therapeutically and mentally and spiritually, it's quite healthy. But there's been this mention of the word called love. Hey! And (laughs) people were showing up with their actions and what they've been saying. And I think... That shift and that change in the use of the language that they say has rippling effects. Yes, it does. And that's really the message, isn't it? That every little bit that we do can make a difference to someone else. Yeah, I've made some great contacts there and people who I would love to work with because when I get back to work, I'm going to be cutting my hours. I do a lot of public speaking and performance back in Melbourne. I'm probably more interested in doing like a one to three month internship. Just going to volunteer in Asia. Oh, great. So we might see you back in Hong Kong. Oh, I want to come back here. (laughs) I know, isn't it cool? (laughs) I was just like, again, you know, it's that thing of stepping outside your comfort zone. So I feel comfortable being, but I want to challenge myself more. And there's nothing wrong with challenging yourself more. It's a great thing. Yeah. And I think there's this level of confidence that comes with it. Because when I came here, being that it was like a crash course in 101, there was another Australian counterpart that set this thing. I'm always dealing more of a national, local community there. But this is international, so it takes on a whole different angle. However, to say, it's not that I fear it, it's just going to... Just keep pushing and putting yourself yeah. out there. So I think now that you're going to be moving more into global activism than local activism, which is yeah, really nice. I, I think yeah. so. Oh, you know, I think the fact that I love multiculturalism. That's why Hong Kong's so fab, because it's so multicultural. I've seen that yeah. and I love that. And it's got something New York about it. Yeah, yeah, and it I is. It's the New story. York of Asia. When I first touched down and I just said, oh my God, after trying to take in all this info and I just said, yeah, but I want to take in Hong Kong. It's, you know, the visual side and the culture itself. Well, Amal, thank you so much for talking to me today. Thank you for sharing your story and for your wisdom and your insight. And it's been an absolute pleasure meeting you. And I hope I see you back in Hong Kong soon. Will do. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi, Confidants. I want to tell you about my Patreon page. I've joined Patreon in the hope of getting sponsorship for my Hong Kong Confidential podcast. Patreon is a great way for my listeners to get on board and sponsor me with monthly payments and that goes towards my production costs and rewards for my members. If you're interested in checking out my Patreon page, please go to patreon.com and search up Jules Hannaford or Hong Kong Confidential. I would really appreciate you visiting my page. So that brings us to the end of another Hong Kong Confidential podcast. I'm Jules Hannaford. Thanks for joining me. And I hope you'll be with me again next week. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please can you go to iTunes to rate and review it. I would really appreciate your feedback. You can email me at jules at hongkongconfidential.net and you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Hong Kong Confidential. If you'd like to hit me up on Twitter, it's at Jules Hannaford. I would love to hear from you. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Oscast. 
simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.